We continue today uh, in our journeys we've been on this summer through the great letter of 1 Peter. If you have your Bibles, rather that be a paper Bible or an app, you may want to open up to 1 Peter or where we'll be. I want to remind you some of the things we've been talking about. And, and we started off 1 Peter, and, we, and we've talked about this often because I think we'll be reminded to put, the, to put this uh, scripture within context is that Christianity from its very beginning was seen as a Jewish faction, like they were revolting against the Jewish way. And toward the middle of the first century, it established itself as, as being unique from Judaism. And because of that, there was persecution. From the very beginning, the church, the church Christians, were persecuted for their faith in Jesus. When they made it known that I'm a follower of the way or I'm a follower of Jesus, that was quite the commitment for them because persecution was coming. And at first they were persecuted by the Jewish religious authorities, such as Saul of Tarsus, which we know later becomes Paul. But before Paul was converted to Christianity, he was a Jewish leader and he persecuted Christians. He was actually there at the stoning of Stephen and gave his approval to that. Later, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians. And from Nero in the first century all the way to the dietitian uh, in the first part of the fourth century, Christians were regularly martyred for proclaiming that Jesus was and is the Son of God. If you were to speak that in this time, it could very much risk your life for saying, I believe Jesus to be Lord and Savior. And then throughout the Middle Ages, and we don't like this part of our history, so to say, but the Roman Catholic Church killed many believers who would not submit to the dogma of the Roman Catholic way. And persecution, read your history books, took place as Roman Catholics didn't understand where Christians were coming from. Today in communist and in Islamic countries around the world, Christians regularly face persecution for their faith. And the warning that I brought to us, church, is we may not see this in America right now. But we see persecutions in many ways, and we see it growing. Peter wrote this letter, though not only to the persecuted church, but to one who is struggling to live out their faith in Jesus, especially when hardships and difficulties come. The difficulty that many of us face is not necessarily persecution. Most of our struggles in the American church come from failure to remain constantly under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Most of our struggles come because we say, I'm going to do it my way and not God's way. We say, I'm not going to be obedient to the teaching of the scripture that I understand. And because of that, many times then we will face struggles and difficulties, but not always because of that. The secret to an effective Christian life is found in living in his strength and not in our own strength, living under his control and not under self-rule. And that's the battle that we find ourselves in. It's easy to serve our Lord and Savior when things are going good. It's easy to say, oh, things are great, life's great, marriage is great, money's great, church is great, I love Jesus. But what about when the storms of life come? What about when the heart attack hits? What about when cancer's announced? What about when the marriage falls apart? What about when finances fail? There are times when we grow weary and it's easy to serve our Lord in the good times, but what about in the struggling times? What about in those moments? Are, can we still say, yes, I trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Can we still say, I, yes, I trust in his plan and his purpose and his way and his directives? And even though I'm going through some hard, crazy stuff, I'm going to trust in his way? See, it's in moments like these that we choose between dealing with life on our own strength or remaining dependent on the Spirit of God within us. If you find yourself in a situation like this this morning and you walk in here and you're like, yeah, I'm dealing with some junk, Brian. Life's been pretty tough lately. Take heart. God has a word of encouragement for you today because God's word is full of encouragement and direction. His desire is to use these difficult situations the struggles to strengthen us and sharpen us and perfect us and to demonstrate to you how he wants to care for you. Those early Christians, I guarantee they were tired. Imagine being chased out of your house because of your belief and faith and you have nowhere to lay your head. Imagine tonight if someone came to your house and they are going to persecute you because you're a believer in Jesus and you run away and tonight you find yourself sleeping under a bridge just to hide. 
Imagine going, where's my next meal coming from? Where am I going to get water from? Where's my friendships at? How am I going to make it when the storm, the rain comes? What am I going to do? This is the kind of stuff they're dealing with. Imagine your business being shut down because of your belief in Jesus. Imagine being fired because I believe in Jesus as my Savior and I lose my job. Imagine the professor failing you in the semester because they didn't like your paper you wrote when you took a stance for Jesus. Imagine that happened. You would be tired and exhausted too. And some of you walk in this room today tired and exhausted. Do you need some rest? Do, do you, do you, are you worn out? Has life gotten you down? And if it's not right now, and if we stay in life long enough, we know right now I may be on cloud nine, but we know tomorrow the storm can come. And so we need to be reminded of this passage, whether we're in the middle of the storm or we know that storm could be coming around the corner sometime. And this is what Peter's dealing with as we turn to our text, 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now I look at this text and I see at least five directives, specifically how God is telling us to rest in him. Basically, to take a chill pill, to, to find your peace in him. He's telling the early Christians, you're going through hard times rest in Christ. You're going through challenging, difficult times. And Peter's like recognizing that and going, I understand life is difficult as you've been scattered abroad because of your faith. But he's saying you can find rest. What does it look like to live a life of rest? To rest in difficulty. To rest in the unexpected that you hadn't planned for. To to live rest when you're dealing with things that, that you wouldn't have chosen to deal with, to live in rest when when you're facing opposition, to experience rest when you're facing rejection. What does it look like to have a life of rest? I think this text directs us to that. We don't live in a perfect world, and, and all of us understand that. All of us know that this world is broken, and this world is falling apart, and this world is full of difficulties and hardships. What is the true experience of your heart in those moments? And the difficulties and the hardships, how do you handle that? Are you tempted to question God's goodness? God, why? Could that be you? Are you tempted to give yourself to sleepless nights filled with worry and anxiety? How do I fix this? How am I going to correct it? Or do you know rest? I want to show you what rest looks like in our text, considering these five directives today. One is to know your place. Rest is about to know our place of where we stand in our relationship with God. Rest is about that. There's a real connection between humility and rest. See, when I place myself at the center of my universe and when I make it all about me and when I try to manipulate circumstances or try to manipulate relationships to make sure that I get everything that I've decided that I need and that I want, and when I live in a constant worry and when I have anxiety and I have constant fear and I have constant discouragement and I have constant disappointment. Disappointment. You see what the problem is? It's one letter. I. Look what it says here. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. What does it mean to know your place. What what does it mean to humble yourselves before God's mighty hand? Well, let me give you some suggestions, some ideas that I I thought about as I'm studying this text. It, It means you trust the wisdom of Almighty God more than you trust your own. That you really believe that His way is wise. That you believe that the things he calls you to are wise and good and true and right. That you humbly believe that this one who knows everything beyond origin and beyond destiny has 
has told you the things that are necessary for you to know in order to live and what he's called you to live, that we trust the creator of the universe and you find joy in his wisdom. But do we? Do you? How many times do we say, well, I got to figure this out. I got to figure that out. I got to figure this out. And we are trying to figure it all out. Or are there times when you step outside of that wisdom because there's something you want or that you think is better? And when you say, well, God, I know your word says, but... As soon as you add that three-letter word in there, you, you've kind of derailed yourself. You, you've gone in the direction that's going to bring challenges and difficulties and hardship. Second, it means that you rested in sovereignty. You really believe that your life is not out of control. It may feel out of control, and, and you'll face mysteries in your life that sometimes you just say, I don't understand. You really have embraced the truth that there's God who actually has become your father. You really believe that the grace of Jesus Christ who rules over all things by his power and by his authority, like he is in charge and the one who rules all these things is the definition of what is good and lovely and true and wise. It means that you walk into every situation or circumstance that when it feels out of control, you know it's not out of control because God's still in charge and, and God is still on the throne and, and God's still still knows what he's doing. All these those things that are under careful control of the wise father, and you're walking through hardships, you're like, but God's still on the throne. God, God's still in charge. God, God still knows what he's doing. He's still the creator of the universe. He still knows me. Do you have that kind of rest? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time, he may exalt you. Humbling myself means I remove the I. And I remove the me. And I say, God, it's not about me. It's not about I. It's about you. And I'll humble myself underneath your plan, underneath your, your goals, underneath your directives, underneath your purpose. The third idea that you, you believe that living out this humble life, you know, is, is that there's blessing and there's reward. If I trust in God's plan and his way, I got to trust there's going to be a blessing and reward. It's living the way human beings were actually meant to to live. It's living out your full humanity as God created you, but you and I were created not to live an independent life. We were made to live a dependent life trusting in the Savior. How many times do you say, well, I got it. Carry it all by myself. I got it all figured out. When I live that way, then I'm living according to the universe and I'm not living according to God. And when we trust in His ways, then we see the blessings he has and the reward he has. And ultimately, we know that we will be exalted. There's some day that we will reign with him. That's mind-blowing. The scripture says the meek will inherit the earth. So we trust in his plan and his purpose. You believe that? See, when you live the humble life, and when you know your place and live in it, you consistently walking with God in his will, that's the pathway to rest. Lord, stuff really stinks in our heart and difficult right now, but I'm going to keep trusting you. Your soul gets rest. Here's the second directive, to rest in God's care. Look at verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. What are the things in your life that give you cause for worry, for concern, for fear, for anxiety, have you, as an act of faith, put those cares in the hand of the Lord? Lord, I'm going to trust you with this situation in life. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my children. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my finances. Now, many times we will do that and give it to him, and then what do we do? We take it back. And so we have to do it again, and we do it over, and we repeat that over and over. Because I don't think there's anything more stunning miracle of grace than that a holy God would invite such people as us to cast our cares on him because he really cares about us. Do you believe the Lord cares about you? Really care about your situation? He cares about your concerns. He cares about your responsibilities. He cares about your opportunities. He cares about your situations and the locations you live in. He cares about your relationships and about your temptations and your weaknesses. I just got to shout from the mountaintop if I could. He cares about you. If you hear nothing else today, walk out of here today going, the Lord cares about me and he cares about my situation. Peter says this to the trouble and persecuted Christians. 
going through crazy hardship that I can't even put words to. I've tried to paint a picture to over the last several weeks. But I think if you were to summarize what I'm hearing here in this scripture right here, dependence upon the Lord means that instead of struggling with our cares and nursing our anxieties and holding on to them and complaining about all that God has allowed to come in our lives, we in turn turn back to him, accepting the truth that he'll sustain us because he what? Cares for you. He cares for us. You know, I stop and I think about some of the scriptures that are mind-blowing. I think about where Jesus says he knows the numbers of hair on her head. Some that's few and some that's many. But he knows how many you have. I think about in that passage, he says he knows when a sparrow falls from the sky. My dog is terrible about bird hunting. Every time we get a little baby nest, the babies are in the backyard and go back there and we find dead birds in the springtime because our dog, and it reminds me often, God knew about that bird. And if he knows about the number of hairs in our head, he knows about the birds from falling in the sky, he knows exactly what you're walking and he cares about it because he cares for you. Why should we do this? Why, why do we rest in it? Because he cares. It's as simple and profound as that. You really can't put much more words to it. The creator of the universe cares about your worries, big or small, and you don't have to carry them alone. It leads me to my third directive. We need to take life seriously. You say, what? Rest? How do I take life seriously? Rest? Well, look at the scripture here. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Sober mindedness in our thinking, in your way of life, being careful about the way you think is a sober mind that is based upon the foundation of scripture as truth, God's holy word. We live in a culture that says, believe what you want to believe. Your truth is your truth. But we, the church, say, no, my truth is not my truth. And I can't believe what I want to believe. I stand on the firm foundation of the holy word of God. Because all scripture is God-breathed and useful for correcting and teaching and training for righteousness. And Peter's saying, listen, that's what you got to stand on. And you got to take that seriously. My belief system, then, is the lens that gives me careful and accurate, serious approach to living. So as I walk through life, what belief system am I going to stand on? A lot of us, we're not at rest because we're standing on a hodgepodge belief system. What's the big idolatry of America? We're going to answer that question. If I were to survey you, you'd probably come up with many answers. I'd say, what is the God of America? But if I were to summarize it down to just one word, I'd say, it's pleasure. I think the God of America is pleasure. We live in a silly society that really doesn't take life seriously. We spend masses of money on things that make no difference whatsoever. Vacations and cars and houses and the list goes on of things we, do, we get ourselves into. In the pursuit of pleasure, we make bad decisions that get us into horrible debt. We allow ourselves to be controlled by physical things until we're addicted to the physical things. Well, I don't have any addictions. Yeah, pull the phone out of your pocket. All of us, we rely upon all this junk and all of this stuff in the pursuit of pleasure. We eat ourselves into ill health because of looking for pleasure and looking for peace. If you look around our Western culture, it's a picture of a culture that not, that's not taking life seriously, and we need to stand against the influences of that culture. A couple of weeks ago, we had a leadership gathering here at church with E2 elders, and Gary Johnson was facilitating our leader gathering. Um, and he would say often, listen, all this stuff around us, it's all going to burn up. We can't take any of it with us. But boy, we try to live like we can. And Peter's saying, listen, you, you got you to gotta watch how you live your life. You got to take life seriously. Are you watchful? Watchful for what? The passage says your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Here's why we take life serious. Because we believe in evil. We believe in good and bad. We believe in personal evil. We believe there really is a, a devil or a Satan or an evil one, whatever title, who is out to divide and to destroy and to devour us. He really is out trying to kill, steal, and destroy. We believe that, and the stakes are high. That's why I think it's valuable sometimes to go through an exercise of baby dedication because moms and dads are going, I, I believe this to be real. And I want my church praying for me and supporting me and encouraging me because we know the evil one wants to destroy our kids. We don't believe in a neutral world. 
There's no such thing. We, we, we believe we live in a moral world where there's, there's moral right and there's moral wrong. Now, I know that's not what our culture says, but if you believe in Jesus as your Savior and your foundation is Scripture, then you cannot live in any other way other than saying there's right and there's wrong. We live in a world where you will not go out of your house without facing temptation. You face it hundreds of times a day, every day, whether you realize it or not. We believe there's an enemy of our souls, and we can't read these words without having a bit of a chill go down your spine. Like, picture that. There's a devil, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Is it me? Is it you? When you wake up in the morning, and the first thing you do is, you fill in the blank, is the evil one in that room? Is he coming after you, coming after your family? In 2009, there's a series that came out called Into the Pride. It was an account of a man who lived with a pride of lions. There was a dominant male lion, a huge lion. His name was Brutus. Now, he didn't know his name was Brutus, but on the show, that's what they called him because he was so big and so dominant. He ruled that pride of lions. But as he's getting old and his dominance was seen in everything he did, except for one afternoon, he's laying down to rest and he gets up from his rest and he started limping as he's walking across the, the land there. And there was a rising male lion who saw that weakness. No warning, jumped on him like lightning, just jumped on him and started chewing him up and started attacking him like I'm taking over and injured the, the old Brutus so bad that Brutus now lost his, his command of the pride of lions, brought him to the ground, brutally injured him and took over that pride, was now in charge. That's your enemy. The enemy is looking for your weakness. The enemy is just waiting for you to make that limp, to make that trip up, to, 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 to be able to, to jump on you. There's a roaring lion looking to devour, looking at those, those places that bring you temptation. and like, oh yeah, let me get that before them because I know they'll trip up. Or, or looking where you make unwise decisions or looking where you expose yourself to things that you should not expose yourself to. And that roaring lion is like, I'm going to jump on you. <clears throat> I want to destroy you. And so we must take life seriously. And we must live watchfully. And we want to live at rest. The fourth directive is very important because it goes to the third one, that we resist him no matter what. Look at verse 9. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of struggles. Very interesting verse here because the resistance of the enemy is put in the context of suffering. Wait, we're talking about suffering and, and the trials and the hardship. We've been talking about how we're called to live differently. And Peter lays this out in the middle of suffering and trials. And I think it's very interesting he does that. And I believe it's because at times of suffering, we are more vulnerable to the attacks of the evil one. See, when you're suffering, you're tempted to get angry. You know when I struggle with being angry? is when I'm laying on the couch sick can't get off the couch. I feel terrible. I'm much more grouchy. I'm much more short fused. And that's why most of us men are known to be wimps when we're sick. And wives are like, yes, can get an amen. The ladies could have helped me out there a little bit. Because when we're sick, our, our defenses are down. When we're suffering, we're tempted to doubt God. When we're suffering, we're tempted to envy other people. We're tempted to question things that we've always believed in. I've never seen somebody who's walking in Jesus and things are going really well to one day just walk away from Jesus. It's when the difficult things come. It's when the marriage falls apart. It's when the finances crash. It's when the loved one dies and people start questioning, does God really care about me? And that's when they tend to walk away from their faith because they're going through the suffering and through the trial and through the hardship. And their faith maybe wasn't quite as strong as they assumed it was. See, when you're suffering, you're tempted to be irritable and unkind and unloving. When you're suffering, you're tempted to be proud and wanting the, the world to kind of dance around you. Hey, I'm going through all this. You know, like be extra kind to me. When you're suffering, it's so interesting that Peter connects standing firm with suffering. And then he does something which is very wise, which I think as you look at this is kind of pastoral wisdom from Peter. He says, resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. What is one of Satan's most regular, um, tempting, seductive lies? Look what I'm going through. Nobody else is going through this. Look at my struggle. Look at my difficulty. God, why would you allow this to happen to me? It's that you're alone in your experience. And somehow, someway, everybody else's life is easy. 
and everybody else has it all together, and you've been singled out for particular suffering, and Satan starts to go, oh, if God really loved you, he wouldn't let you go through that. And Peter's like, listen, he's letting everybody go through struggles. He's letting everybody go through difficulties. And that's what follows. What happens is we get into that mindset, and then we start saying, well, God, where are you? Because that's the little voice of the evil one. Why isn't he loving you like everybody else he loves? Or why isn't he being faithful to you like he's faithful to everyone else? Where's the grace that he's giving everyone else? Why aren't you experiencing it when everybody else is? And Peter says, don't you understand the things you're suffering are kind of a universal experience because we live in a broken, fallen world and everybody's going through pain and trial? So you live in a fallen world, somehow, some way, suffering will enter your door. If you're old enough, you're like, yeah, I've been through it. I've been through the ups and I've been through the downs. Maybe right now you're in a great season. Praise Jesus. Chances are you turn the corner and suffering's going to come. If you're young, you may say, I haven't been through much of that. This is a warning. This may be coming. It's coming. Because if you live on this earth, trials and pain and hardship and difficulties and suffering's coming. And if you stand for Christ and a culture that has rejected him, somehow suffering will be part of that experience. If you're really willing and ready to stand. You haven't been singled out for particular suffering. Your experience is the same experience of all God's children. You know the one thing we don't do in the church? We don't walk in here wearing t-shirts that say things like, yeah, I've been through a divorce. Hey, I've hit bankruptcy. We don't wear a t-shirt saying I've dealt with cancer. We don't wear a t-shirt saying I have mental health issues. I walk through depression and anxiety. We don't wear t-shirts saying, here's my struggle. But the truth be told, just look at the person on your right or left. Every single one of us have some kind of struggle in our background. But we don't walk around announcing it. So when we start feeling like, well, it's just me. But it's not. And some of the most comforting and relieving and helpful aspects is when you get to know somebody and you get to know their story and you're like, oh, you've been through You've been through four miscarriages? I didn't know there's other people with miscarriages. Oh, you've been through the death of a child? I didn't know that. Oh, you've battled addiction of alcohol? I didn't know you had that challenge in your life. Oh, you've lost a child? We don't know those things. This is why I think the opportunity to pray at the end of service is so, so important. And there's been a growing move of prayer. Our prayer team will be up here later. Brian is going to invite you all to pray. Because you walk over and you look at somebody and say, man, I'm just walking through some junk. And someone put their arm around you and they love you. And they're like, yeah, I've been through junk too. And we support one another. We encourage one another. We walk with each other. He's protecting his readers from the temptation to listen to an evil lie of the enemy, which leads us to the last directive, trust God's sanctifying grace. Look at verse 10 and 11. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. steadfast. Your Lord, in other words, will not turn from his grace. He's not going to turn his back. Suffering will, will not stop his transforming hand. He will continue to transform. Circumstances will not get in the way of his work to redeem. It won't get in the way. He, he will finish the work that he started, and he will restore. He will confirm. He will strengthen. He will establish. His grace is sure, and his grace is sufficient, and he will not relent until his work is completely done in, in our hearts and in his people. Our God, in other words, not going to give up. And so Peter says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. It's right that this kind of passage then should end with what's known as a doxology. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I give him all the glory. I give him all the power. What is Peter saying? But what Peter is saying, he says, even though you're facing hard things, and even though you don't understand your circumstances, and even though you'll face mysteries of your life, and even though you'll find yourself in places you don't want to be, and even though you'll experience misunderstanding and rejection, the Lord still rules. And when I believe that, and I walk through life in that way, I can walk in rest. I can walk in peace. Because of that, you can get up in the morning even though you're facing tough things. And because of that, you can rest in your heart and live with courage and hope. You can sleep at night even though there are things going on in your life that are bigger than you because of your hope. It isn't in your control it isn't in your power. It isn't in your righteousness. It isn't in your strength or in your wisdom. It's in one place. 
It's in him and his domain. Do you know that? Is that your experience? Your Savior lived and suffered and died and purchased for his people a Sabbath of rest. Do you know that rest today? Bow your heads with me. Father God, we thank you.